Welcome to the another episode of the ARE Startup Podcast and today we have our special guest with us Tom Jefford and we're going to talk about the social entrepreneurship and social enterprise in general. Tom Jefford is a business development director and a CEO at Family Psychology Mutual CIC and I'm pleased to invite Tom on the show. Hi Tom. Hi. How are you feeling today? Very good, thanks. Thanks for inviting me. I've been reading your profile and you're more focused towards social enterprise and social entrepreneurship in general. Mm-hmm. So I think we are going to begin about uh, what is social enterprise to you mm-hmm. and uh, how how does it work and where it all started in your journey? Okay, so uh, I mean social enterprise is a pretty broad church and it doesn't really have a very good definition. Um, Family Psychology Mutual is a community interest company um, so in many ways it operates like a regular company, but we uh, had to register our community benefit uh, with the CIC regulator. Um, and that helps us to really sort of define what our social benefit is going to be. Um, so to a lot of the time we're operating like a normal uh, regular business, um, but we are also an employee owned business. So everyone who joins has a share and that share then leaves with them uh, when when they finish with the company. Um, we don't share uh, profit. Um, any surplus that we make, we reinvest into the business, and that enables us to have quite a high rate of training of staff, um, but it also ena- enables us to sustain ourselves as a, as a viable uh, operating entity. Um, I mean, the story of how we started is that I'd worked in public services for a, a long time, um, I've been involved in a number of services which began to do some trading, uh, particularly around evidence-based interventions for young people at risk of care or custody. And I'd also become, begun to become exposed to uh, social investors who were creating outcome-based contracts, also known as social impact bonds. And that gave me some confidence that there might be an opportunity to trade the businesses that, and, and services that I was operating on a wider platform. Um, and at that time, there was quite a lot of encouragement to develop what became known as public service mutuals, uh, which is the idea that you take a, um, uh, a team or a service out of a local authority or the NHS and you create uh, a company so that it can trade. Um, and so that's what we did. Essentially, we were trying to understand what that company would look like uh, and define its value uh, and what the kind of value proposition of that business was going to be, and also work with the staff team and say, there's a future outside of the local authority and do you want to come with me or not? Yeah. Um, and uh, so it took a bit of time, um, but we did what was known as a 2P transfer, where we transferred an existing bus- uh, an existing team into the new business, um, protecting people's rights and entitlements. Uh, and we established an anchor contract with the local authority, which was our first piece of business. Um, in order to then get ourselves out and established. Um, And quite quickly, we won some new work, um, which was backed by a social investor. Uh, Sadly, the original contract that we had with the local authority um, was withdrawn by the local authority after a year, which was a real real shock, uh, and we could have folded at that point. But because we had new work, we were able to sustain ourselves um, and grow the business, and now we have... um, Services in Norfolk and Suffolk and in London, we're just in the process of establishing a new randomised controlled trial. Yeah. So we now have about 45 staff um, operating. Um, and uh, so far, so good. We've been going for, I think, six or seven years now. When, when we talk about social entrepreneurship, it's not just about the investment in terms of time and energy, but also about the passion for the social costs. Yeah. So uh, in the beginning, when you, when you thought of starting this venture, uh, what was the idea of going into social enterprise? Was there any particular story or, or a reason that was very personal to you that you thought, okay, I, I think this is something that I want to invest my time and energy going forward into? So our passion has always been around working with families and working with families using the best available methodologies. So we were using interventions such as multi-systemic therapy and more recently something called functional family therapy. Uh, these are quite intensive psychologically driven uh, interventions. Uh, So we employ social workers and mental health nurses, psychologists and systemic therapists. Um, And to really concentrate on that practice and create and facilitate the best environment 
for people to practice in that particular way. Um, and so doing that outside of the confines of a local authority, um, but working in partnership with a local authority where we're very clear about the interventions we're providing and really focusing on that uh, was the core aim. Um, and really trying to kind of push and develop that in as many places as, as we could. Um, with an eye to the outcomes. We were a very outcome-led organization. We're a very data-driven organization. Um, and we want to really enable people to be the best social worker or therapist that they can be yeah. um, at all times. Um, and so this structure, I think, has helped us in that journey. Um, and I think one of the things that attracts people to work for us is, is the value proposition that we've put forward, both in how we're uh, constituted as a business, so employee-owned, and a social enterprise, um, really trying to kind of live up to our values as, as often as we can and, and as clearly as we can. Any particular uh, output that has recently been impressive and growing massively in the regions that it's been serving in? So we have a contract in Norfolk to provide functional family therapy. It's an outcomes-based contract. We work with a social investor called Bridges Fund Management. Um, they've invested in us. Uh, we have a very con good relationship with them and also with the local authority. It's a long-term contract. We're at five years. Um, the intervention takes place uh, with our team based w uh, within Norfolk, um, and the outcomes are then tracked for two years after the intervention has come to an end. The intervention typically lasts around five to six months. Um, and every day a young person is not in the care system yeah. attracts a payment um, and so there's a very strong tracking of whether young people are in care or not in care um, and we are now at around 150,000 care days saved um, over the course of um, the, the intervention so far which is an impressive figure um, and when you begin to add that as a money multiple mm. uh, it more than pays for the service it also pays back to the investor um, the investment that they've made. Um, the investor carries the risk. We have what's known as a fee-for-service contract. So although we are very driven in our performance and try and get high utilisation of the intervention, uh, make sure that we are using our staff and resources as effectively as possible, um, we're protected in some ways from uh, any kind of perverse incentives to maybe hang on to a case when the a young person should be in care when it's not really safe for them to remain in the community. But uh, it's been a, a really uh, helpful development uh, for yeah. us. Um, we invest a lot of our time, effort and energy, both in the data and the governance um, to ensure that it, all of the moving parts are working as effectively as possible. Yeah, and, and particularly now we are talking about social enterprise, social entrepreneurship mm. in general. Um, what is what are the few key differences between a social enterprise ventures projects to that of the rest? And how the investment work, mm -hmm. if it is different? And is there any privileges that social entrepreneurs have got in terms of when they raise investments because they've got a social objective in mind, uh, not focusing on uh, the monetary terms primarily? Okay, okay. so, right. Um, well, I suppose the first thing is that, is that social enterprise doesn't have a particularly strong legal definition, uh, and that doesn't really help. So we've chosen to be a community interest company. We could have been a community benefit society, or we could have been an industrial and provident society. Mm. Yeah. And they all have slightly different legal formats and responsibilities. Community interest companies are very similar to regular companies. Um, so uh, banks and investors understand them as companies. Yeah. Um, I suppose there's, there's the rather vexed question of are you making profit, are you not making profit? Um, because the, the word non-profit also is, is associated to social enterprise. Um, we're a trading business, so we need to make a profit or surplus, otherwise we're making a loss and then we will go out of business. Um, but we don't profit share, so if we make additional surplus funds, then we try and re reinvest them in training in particular uh, for our staff. Uh, and we also have to bank our money for the times when the contracts come to an end. Um, I think that uh, we've benefited a lot from working with the social investor. Um, they are trying to find opportunities to create new service opportunities and also to work with outcome-based 
contracts. They want to work with a provider that is in it for the practice um, and also wants to work with them collaboratively and has got the professional skills to be able to work with their local authority, um, with staff who have um, regulated positions like social workers or nurses mm -hmm. or psychologists. Uh, so it's been a good fit for us. Um, that said, um, you know, they want to performance manage us hard um, and that's also been a dynamic we've become very accustomed to uh, and we're very clear about how we want to uh, meet the terms of the contracts that we work with uh, and try and develop as much added value as we as we possibly can. I think one of the things I've learned as a uh, someone who set up both the Family Psychology Mutual and another business I'll talk about in a moment um, is that there's actually a lot of generosity out there. Uh, people who want to support you uh, either through uh, mentoring or through yeah. um, support services, <coughs> uh, programs, uh, networks. Um, and actually it's been a, a real delight to work with other social entrepreneurs because there are lots of people that want to sell you things. There's lots of people that says, say, you know, you need to buy this or how to do that. Um, and so actually asking people, um, learning from their experience, you know, do you need an accountant? Do you need a website? Do you need tax advice? Um, how do you do this? How do you manage debt? How do you price yourself in the marketplace? Um, these are really important questions. Um, and you have to find your own way through that. Um, and often working with people in a similar position, even if they're from a very, very different business, um, can be really, really helpful. Yeah, uh, particularly in terms of investments for social uh, entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. um, is, it, is it different to raising uh, investment f with the angel investors or other sort of businesses? Not particularly, no. I, don't, I think that um, I mean, we, we've been fortunate that we started with a grant that was reasonably uh, large when we started, but we knew that we would need that in order to sustain ourselves because we weren't going to make profit on the single contract that we had. So we knew we, we would win further work, but it was important to, to be able to trade to develop our story, yeah. uh, develop our credibility as a, as a business, and get to a, a point where we could win further business. Um, so uh, we haven't taken on uh, significant debt. Uh, we could do, and lots of people I've met have uh, offered to invest in the business. Um, we might at some point, um, but we would do so with the consent and agreement of the whole company that we were going to do that. Um, I think that uh, working with a, a social investor has been hugely beneficial for us because they fronted up a lot of that um, themselves uh, in order to create the opportunity to, to develop those businesses um, in Norfolk and Suffolk and we're now working with a grant in London for a randomised control trial so that's a different form of funding. Um, so I think it depends very much on what the business is seeking to achieve um, and how you can manage growth. I mean actually funnily yeah. enough one of the risks of any business is that you can grow too quickly or you you don't grow at all. Mm. So finding the sweet spot of growing at a, at a pace that you can manage without uh, either diluting the value of the company or um, running the risk of reducing quality, um, they're some of the things that we, we think about too. Now, on, on the same note, um, so do the investors, so you mentioned about social investors, mm. um, do these investors have, uh, uh, they prioritize the social cause first before invest? over the scalability, profitability, and the break-even, or do they prioritize the later ones first and then the social costs? So um, the Dormant Assets Fund that was created and uh, that created Big Society Capital uh, created almost like a wholesale market for investment. And from that, a number of companies were established and funded, um, so Bridges Fund Management, Social and Sustainable Capital, Big issue investor, for example, yeah. uh, and they are all seeking opportunities to invest in the marketplace, particularly through social enterprises, right. to develop social value. Okay. Um, and so, I mean, the big society capital wants a return on that investment. So mm. uh, these are commercial propositions, yeah. but at their heart is uh, social value and the delivery of social outcomes. Yeah. Um, so 
it's fortuitous that this came at the right time for us, but there are lots of projects around uh, homelessness, uh, environmental issues, um, health and well-being, um, outcomes for children and families, um, which are clearly socially valued. Um, the clever part is to try and work out how you can um, develop and monetize the social mm -hmm. value to create a proposition that then says this service can do this for X amount of money, but the reward in terms of cashable social outcomes yeah. uh, and the added benefits of, of all of that um, far outweigh the investment that would be needed in order to create that. So we have to work quite carefully with commissioners um, and also try and understand, well, are these truly the values and the outcomes that we want? And can we be confident that we've created them? That they didn't create, well, they weren't created in some other way by some other process. Yeah. Um, so if you were dealing with, I don't know, a project about say youth employment, there's a rise and fall in the employ in the employment rate based on the general economy. But what did you do that made it that much better? That created that you know much better jobs or many more opportunities that wouldn't have existed anyway. It's from a student perspective, generally speaking. Mm -hmm. um, for example, if a student has got a, a particular a fantastic social uh, concept with mm -hmm. with, uh, with a great social outcomes they're expecting and they have not particularly focused on the scalability report at this point mm -hmm. can they still go for uh, raising funds and investment for the company can they think about the profitability later and focus on the outcomes first yeah one of the things that i think angel investment it does is is almost at a conceptual level is trying to understand whether you can get to the point of proof of concept mm. and that has a value I mean you can think of that in the kind of life sciences around um, you know ex more experimental work um, but the uh, the opportunity to experiment in the social world uh, is also very clear yeah um, and so if you can convince an, an investor that actually if you can prove that by doing this piece of work you can achieve X outcome or, you, or if you can house offenders and get them into work you know we all benefit Hugely. Um, question then is, uh, is, it, is there a clear enough relationship between your activity and someone wanting to fund the outcome that that achieves? And sometimes you need to do that with, with multiple stakeholders. Uh, so you can get into complexity quite quickly. But if you can get to the point of proof of concept, I mean, that, that has a value. Um, and then from that, you can then think about replica, replicability and scale. And one of the things that I've uh, spent quite a lot of my time and my career doing, and also my academic um, doctorate here at um, ARU, uh, is understanding through um, the application of implementation science is when does scale and replicability work and when doesn't it work, and what are the kind of key elements of that. So these are quite tricky things to do. Understanding what it is you do and what you bring to the party is really important. So you can see some really successful entrepreneurs um, and actually they get to a certain size and they almost need to stay at that size because they are part of the essential element as to why their business works so well because it's a it's often about their yeah what they're bringing to the party uh, and so developing other people to do those things for you is 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 a whole different game if you like yeah moving on a bit uh, the the, and the venture that you have got, it's called the Edge Cafe. Yeah. So please elaborate this more. What is this about and how does this serve the community? Okay, so um, I used to be involved in drug and alcohol commissioning. I spent quite a lot of time um, working with adults who were in recovery. Uh, and there was an opportunity to uh, create a business as a trading entity for adults to run a cafe. Um, adults in recovery, that is. Uh, so we have a, uh, we created the Edge Cafe. Um, it is a commercial cafe in a meeting room. Um, it's run collaboratively with adults in recovery from substance misuse. Uh, and it's been a completely different sort of social enterprise uh, because it's, mm. it's very close to the community. Yeah. Um, we have adults in recovery who are volunteers, uh, they're members of staff. Uh, we've just extended to a second cafe at Fullbourne Hospital um, last year. Uh, so it has some vulnerabilities and fragilities, uh, but the 
rewards are very high. We've been able to progress people um, through their journey towards um, abstinence, um, towards uh, further employment and training, but more importantly, to be able to enable them to rejoin the community. Because mm -hmm. if you've been through the treatment system, and particularly if you've been to residential treatment, you need to lose your old life and start and engage with a new life, um, which isn't about taking drugs or drinking, um, which is about finding the things in, in you which you enjoy, can sustain you, can keep you honest and on, the, on a pathway uh, to support your continued recovery. Um, so people in, re in recovery need to attend to that recovery every day. Uh, and uh, you know people have uh, hiccups and falls in the road. We've lost some people, we've lost them, and then they've come back and rejoined us. Um, and it's been a, a real pleasure and a delight. We have a, a, a food hub, uh, we have great food offer. Um, we also have uh, a lot of vulnerable adults we support and it's become a trusted organization within the community. So, you know, I think we can be proud of what we mm. what it's achieved. Um, it just about manages to wash its face. Uh, it does need some, some continued grant support. Um, but we always wanted it to be a commercial entity and to feel like a mid-market commercial cafe, not to feel like a, um, you know, something that's run as a like in a church hall sort of sort of thing. Mm. Um, and it's largely been successful. Um, but yeah. it does it does need attention, and I think it will always need attention and support. Um, unlike my day job business, which you know is a professional services business, which um, hopefully will grow within the professional services uh, like economy. We are in the process of you know, transforming people's lives and, and helping them to, to yeah. find new ways of working. And so again, I'm trying to empower people to be the best that they can be. Um, and I think the democratic structure of the, the business helps in that because I continue to tell people that they are the business owners and therefore we're wanting them to take good decisions for the business and have an adult to adult relationship. Yeah, no, indeed successful because the organic development progress you're talking about, that, that says it all. Any expansion plan to go into different cities as well? Um, so expanding into Fullbourne, uh, which took a long time because eventually a, a, a new build was created and we've run a cafe in the new resort, resource centre they've opened. Um, I think I might have to wait until I'm uh, either working less or retired and then I can concentrate more on on the Edge Cafe yeah. um, because it was a bit <coughs> of a stretch and it's been a, and we're continuing to work out how our infrastructure catches up um, to become a business that's turning over you know two hundred thousand pounds a year because yeah. um, a lot of it is is with people on a voluntary basis and we just don't have the funds to have a you know like a a, a strong back office it, it's it's me and a couple of other people and sometimes. You know, it's it's a bit of a stretch, um, but it could. And there's no reason why it, it couldn't expand. There are uh, there's a business called Social Bite in um, uh, Scotland, which was developed in Edinburgh around homelessness, which has developed a number of cafes across Scotland now, uh, and it's definitely a, a, a viable business. Um, and you become uh, aware of other social businesses doing similar things, and and there. Are networks you know you find people up and have a conversation with them about things there's hmp pasties which came out of manchester prison there's uh redemption roasters who've got uh, stuff going on in Aylesbury prison around coffee production they've now um got uh, cafes in london as well uh there's lots of places yeah, yeah. and actually you begin to seek them out um and they're all doing similar things and similar journeys but they're often run by really passionate people and it's it's great to see thanks for sharing all your uh, stories and the, and the ventures that you have started and uh, uh, the impact that the companies uh, they're trying to leave on on the community um so you have been in in the social enterprise journey for long now mm -hmm. any particular incident with regards to outcome that you have thought the change that you have uh, personally seen and you thought this this was worth it in terms of the way these companies are running? Um, I guess, I, I mean, when I feel particularly proud around what Family Psychology Mutual has done is both the record of achievement and the number of care days saved. But when I hear from the therapists around a particular family where families have 
faced overwhelming odds and adversity. Um, and through really kind of careful and attentive work, often in very difficult circumstances with very distressed people, uh, getting to the point where the family is able to uh, manage itself um, and to overcome those difficulties and, and to feel confident that they can manage adversity going forward is, is, a, is fantastic. And um, we often hear you know, that it's the therapist that's made the difference. Yeah. Uh, and we know that it's the infrastructure, the training, the support uh, behind the therapist and the, uh, the, the careful consideration of you know, how they're going to work with this family who lots of uh, other agencies might have given up on or have had a very, uh, you know, have given a very poor prognosis in terms of the outcomes that are likely for the, for the young person in particular. Um, when we're able to turn that around, it is, it is uh, uh, you know, wonderful. Um, I mean, I, I try not to kind of romanticise it too much because I know that this is hard work and the therapists have to kind of put up with a lot sometimes. Um, so that's a, that's a real thrill. Um, and I'm also really pleased when we have, uh, people have positive engagement with The Edge. Um, we recently did a outside catering for like 500 people is, is, you know, huge amounts of work. So we had a, a young woman with Down syndrome who came to write, do her first shift in the cafe. And her mum was there watching her and her mum was sitting there with tears in her eyes um, because she's seeing her daughter being productive and interacting with um, the customers and you know, getting lots of positive feedback. Uh, so th those moments are really special. Um, yeah. And, uh, you know, you, 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 you try to set things up for people to succeed uh, and when it works, it's, it's a delight. But it's usually because, you know, lots of things have worked um, and the, the effort and, and reward is, has been, been paid back. For our students, who are, we have got a, a good number of students mm -hmm. who are every year submitting their ideas into the pitching competitions with their, uh, with their social concepts mm -hmm. that is going to change the world for, for the good. So any advice for them uh, at the early stage social entrepreneurs, uh, what they should be mindful of, how they should start, and any, any particular tips that you want to share? I think being persistent. I think having faith in your ideas, but also... Um, understanding where opportunities might exist. And I mean, there are two business stories I particularly like. One is that there was a, um, uh, years ago when people used to get the train from London to New Haven to get the ferry to France, um, there was a chemist shop in Victoria Station and people used to go there having returned from France to buy things. And they'd say, oh, can I pay? Oh, I've got a load of francs left here. Can I pay in francs? And the shop got fed up with this. But eventually they realised that actually what they should do is they should become a, a foreign exchange outlet rather than a chemist shop. Mm. And eventually they, they did that and then they became international currency exchange and they bought a bank. So they completely transformed their business because mm. people were turning up with, with francs in the same way that garages make more money selling coffee than they do selling petrol. Um, so I, I, like those, I like those ideas. Um, I mean, Twitter was created out of a company that was going bust. And the liquidators turned up and said, anybody got any ideas that you were developing that you want to take forward once this company folds? And someone put their hand up and said, I've got this idea for this thing where you can do 140 characters or whatever it was. Mm. Um, and that's how Twitter was born. Yeah. So opportunities can come from the, the oddest of places. Um, but if you follow your nose and you think you can make sense of it uh, and you've got a passion for it, then you know, why not? There's a brilliant story recently about a guy who um, uh, set up a, uh, he went to a, a, an entrepreneur's class and the professor said, let's wake up stupid businesses. And he said, I'll, I'll set up a business selling tumbleweed. Um, you know, and everyone laughed. And then he did it and he became quite rich. So he actually set up a business where he went in, out into the desert and collected loads of tumbleweed and put it in the back of a van. And then he started selling it to um you know, TV production companies and film companies, and he became the number one tumbleweed guy. <laughs> I mean, it's crazy, but, you know, who would have thought it? So your imagination and your ideas can take you anywhere. Um, so, you know, don't, don't, be, don't be put off. I'm always amazed at what people can, can do. 
Uh, I mean, so, look, lots of people want to run a cafe and lots of people want to run a service business or lots of people want to, to do, you know, very straightforward, very normal things. And you can do that as a social business, but you can do loads of like weird stuff too. Um, so don't be put off. And also expect people to, to challenge you, but also expect people to be generous with their time and, 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 and listen to you and, and refine your ideas too. That, that was a great example. Thank you so much. And, and thanks for joining. And thank you, everybody who's watching us. Thanks for joining us. And we'll see you in the next episode of the ARU Startup Podcast. Thank you.